Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the call, Wednesday, 8th June, 2022. Um, the topic for this call is accessibility. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a free-for-all call, I hope, um, in that what prompted this was a question originally from Ollie Sisman of London Sport about the fact that there's actually a few different ways of approaching accessibility defined in connection to Open Active. Um, I'll walk you all a little bit through the history of that. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that um, consultation hasn't been perfect with the accessibility aspects of the specification. I think sometimes we've been talking to system providers um, about the kind of data they have. Other times we've been talking to disability advocates about the kind of data they'd like to see. Uh, those two do not really exist in the same world and what we really need to do is build a bridge. So I'm hoping that on this call today, uh, we can talk about the practicalities of how we get from where we are now uh, to where we would hopefully like to be in future. Um, it's gonna be a fairly wide ranging exercise. Lots of organizations have attempted to um, answer these questions before. Um, I don't think we're gonna be coming to a solution immediately. So I would see this as the first of, of hopefully several calls and maybe possibly breakout groups looking at this over the longer term. Uh, but I think uh, the current group of people we've got here are a great place to start. Uh, so without further ado, I will start off by introducing myself and then I'll call upon you all. Um, I'm Timothy Hill of the Open Data Institute, um, technical lead on the Open Active project. Um, Andrew Marshall. Andrew Marshall, Principal Architect at Gladstone. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Natalia Stanowska. That was very well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Natalia. I'm the Parasport Engagement Officer at the British Paralympic Association. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, Phil. Uh, Phil Allen, Senior Developer at Gladstone. Thanks, Phil. Debbie. Uh, Debbie Giordano from Everyone Active. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, other Tim. Hi, I'm Tim Corby, a consultant on the Open Active Initiative for the Open Data Institute. Uh, Dom. Hello, uh, Dom from IMIN. Thank you, Dom. Uh, Matt. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt, the uh, Chief Technology Officer at Startup Call How Place. Um, just an FYI, quite fittingly, I'm at the cafe in my local gym, so apologies if you can hear the music, I'll be trying to mute myself as much as possible. I, I think showing up for an open active call from a gym is, you know, fine form. Yeah, no, no problem there. Um, Ollie Sisman. Hi, uh, yeah, Ollie from London Sport. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, Barry. Hi, all. I'm a Parasport Engagement Manager at the British Parliament Association. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Chris? Hi, uh, Chris Nelfield, Head of Digital Paper Change at London Sport. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Siv? Hi, I'm Siv, developer at IMIN. Thank, thanks, Siv. And finally, Nick Evans. Hello, uh, Nick from IMIN. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all. Um, so yeah, as I said uh, at the head of the call, um, this was all prompted by, by Ollie uh, saying, I think in, in conversation with Matt, uh, how are we supposed to be dealing with accessibility um, in the specifications? Because in fact, there's more than one way to do it. Uh, so I'll just share, ooh, I was going to share screen. Zoom is not very happy with that. Sorry, Zoom. <laughs> Some updated security settings mean I cannot share my screen. One moment, please. Um, there we go. Okay, sorry, I'm afraid I cannot share my screen without quitting and reopening Zoom, which I think would be more trouble than it would be worth. Um, I will actually just post a link to the uh, presentation into the chat here. And if you could just open it up on your own, I think that might be easier than uh, fiddling about with Zoom.
So everybody should have, if you look in the chat window, you should have a link to the presentation there. Um, I can see, okay, yes, we've got uh, eight viewers right now, including me, nine, okay, going up. So I feel confident everyone's got that. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a history. If you go to slide uh, number two there, I'll give you a history of open active and accessibility. Nick might want to jump in uh, with corrections and clarifications uh, since I wasn't present from the very beginning. Um, I think it's fair to say that accessibility has been a shortcoming of the physical activity sector for a long time. Um, obviously, as Open Active, we can't deal with all of that. Um, you know, we're about data exchange, uh, so it's really about the kinds of information that can be shared uh, to do with accessibility needs from an Open Active uh, perspective. Um, but the sector as a whole does have difficulties uh, both with providing accessible services and with making that known to the wider world. Um, Sport England at various times has taken a look at this. UK Active has also taken a look at this and both concluded that there were, there were serious challenges there. At times there has been funding available to improve this. Um, but I think overall it's fair to say that accessibility insofar as it's made many inroads at all, it's often seen purely in terms of, of mobility. Um, and in particular, uh, wheelchair accessibility. Um, but even within that definition of, of what accessible means, uh, even in that area, often uh, people with accessibility needs are not served well. Um, and this, so this has been on organizations' radar for a fair while now. I think it's been a concern con repeatedly expressed over the last decade or so. Um, it's probably gaining in profile because social prescribing is becoming a more active concept in the physical activity space. And for people who are doing social prescribing, link workers often have got um, a, a deep interest in, in accessibility and need to be able to give their clients accessibility information that's reliable and relevant to them. So always acknowledged as important and becoming more so, but with perhaps that concern not being matched by a lot of action. Um, if you move on to slide three, uh, looking at accessibility was always a part of Open Active uh, back in the back in the earlier days uh, with uh, Nick uh, largely leading the initiative. Um, so there's a controlled vocabulary defined for describing um, accessibility, and that's linked to on the on the GitHub link in that presentation. Um, and it's a very simple controlled vocabulary. Uh, it just consists of six terms, uh, visual impairment, hearing impairment, physical impairment, learning impairment, mental health issues, and social or behavioral problems. So this would be simply a tag that you could add indicating um, that a particular activity was in some way suitable for people with those particular impairments or, or issues. Um, that could be coupled with amenity feature, which is a data point in the specification, which is about the physical um, environment in which an activity takes place. And this is a typical recurring problem in accessibility modeling, because to some extent, um, accessibility related features might be considered an attribute of the particular activity or a particular class. Um, if you've got, say, a yoga class with uh, sign language interpretation provided, that would be associated with that particular class. On the other hand, if it's something like accessible toilets, that's a feature of the building in which that class takes place. So the question of where you hold all of this information and how you make sure it can be accessed readily and suitably uh, is, is a little bit tricky because there's at least two places where it could live. Um, but that was the uh, original approach to accessibility in the opportunity specification was you could use that controlled vocabulary to indicate uh, impairments for which an activity had been designed to address or mitigate, uh, and then amenity feature would describe physical features of physical plant. Um, Nick, did you have anything that you wanted to add in there, actually, uh, since we're looking at that aspect of the spec? Uh, only that there's also a beta property called wheelchair accessible or is where wheelchair accessible, uh, I think something like that, which is on the place right, uh, on top of the uh, amenity feature uh, stuff you just mentioned there. Um, and, um, and otherwise, yeah, just to reiterate that it was done 
Uh, I think it was done. Uh, there's a spreadsheet somewhere in the in the GitHub history. Uh, it was done by analyzing all the data that existed rather than what would any aspirational goal. Mm -hmm. So it was almost what is the data that's currently being stored in all of the platforms and what, how is that represented? So it was a bottom up approach. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what led to this. And then I think the social, the, the, the last of those social behavioral uh, issues or whatever it's called, um, that came from consultation with EMD because I think EMD did an independent consultation and came to the same list, except they had that one as well. So they, they, that was added in um, because it seemed like a minor omission from the first round of kind of bottom up work. Um, yeah, and that's that's been, I think that's the thing that's been implemented in the most places um, mm -hmm. so far. Uh, and then obviously Tim will talk about the next bit. Um, oh, sorry, Nick, if I can just stop you as well. Um, probably, yeah, obviously you won't have a knowledge of the entire data ecosystem, but do you have a sense of how widely those attributes are implemented? Um, I know that they're at least in, they're at least in two of leisure management systems. Um, okay. and they are in, uh, they're in book when, and where else they are. Yeah. And possibly in the Parasport, uh, finder as well, but Donald know more about that. So I, I think that's probably, that's just off the top of my head. I, I know that there are some of the accessibility attributes actually are, are more broadly adopted because there's also a, a, a free text field that's in, for example, British cycling. Um, so. It's in at least five places, but mm -hmm. it may well be in, in many more. Okay. Right. Okay, just to get as much of a baseline as we can on, on where we are in, in implementation. Thanks. Um, I'll just take a quick detour. Um, on slide three, I mentioned uh, what I believe is the London sport vocabulary for these things, because it takes a similar kind of approach. Um, and Ollie might want to jump in if I'm getting this wrong. Uh, but we've got from London sport, there's learning disability, physical impairment, deaf, mental health condition, visual impairment, and then there's a sort of, I suppose, uh, MISC file, participant or support worker should get in contact for more information. Um, is that substantially correct, Ollie? Is that the entirety of how accessibility is dealt with in um, open sessions? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you could add free text if you want to in, in other fields, but that's, that's exactly right. Oh, right. So yeah, people might add a description saying you know, this accommodations are made in these ways. Okay. Um, so yeah, similar, a similar kind of approach. Oh, sorry. One more question about that, Ollie, or possibly Chris might want to answer this. So when people are invited to get in contact for more information, the assumption is that there's been a phone number or an email address provided, and then people will just use that default contact channel. Yeah, exactly. That'll be a, something associated with the with the session. Okay, cool. Um, and how how frequently is that option used in open sessions? Do you have a sense of that? Off the top of my head, no. To be honest, I, I can have a look. But, um, I can tell you right now. Okay, that's. Uh... Yeah, that'd be useful maybe after the call if you want to get a sense of how how often these these options are used. But um, okay, so that was that was one approach to accessibility. Um, just pre-pandemic, I suppose, um, work was started on another approach to accessibility. Um, and if you look at slide five, there's there's links actually to a whole website uh, that describes the Open Active proposal for accessibility. Um, and uh, <laughs> I did, this is basically me doing a lot of this stuff. Um, and the reason I felt like this was necessary was that some disability groups were not happy with the general approach of sort of categorizing by impairment, really. Um, so the feedback that, that we received was that for people with accessibility needs, it was often much more useful to know what kind of mitigations were in place than what kind of disability an activity was intended for, um, with the notion that there was actually quite a broad spectrum possible. So on one, one end of the spectrum, you do have 
classes that are specifically intended for people suffering from particular kinds of accessibility issues. Um, and those were fairly well captured by the existing way of, of describing accessibility, but that, um, for instance, there might be classes that don't have a particular accommodation, but the facility has got a hearing aid loop, or um, there would be for people on the um, autism spectrum, there might be particular accommodations made in a class that was also suitable for people who didn't um, have, uh, weren't on that spectrum to attend. So the idea was that, <clears throat> Oh, or another example would be aging, that, that people as they get older often start requiring particular accommodations to be made, even if they wouldn't normally label themselves as having a disability. Um, so uh, we started talking to uh, lots of disability advocacy groups about what kind of information was most useful to people with accessibility needs. Um, and that was what gave rise to this much more uh, involved specification, uh, which is described in the accessibility microsite. Um, so to some extent, this was really more about providing guidance on existing um, attributes more than it was about creating new ones. Um, so things like amenity feature are still in place. Uh, contact point uh, is, is still in place. Um, but then there were a bunch of other uh, data points that were added. So um, accessibility support level to indicate that distinction I, I mentioned earlier about whether or not this was something that was specifically intended for people with particular conditions or whether this was something that was um, uh, a class in which accommodations might be made, uh, but anybody would be welcome to participate. Uh, carer policy was highlighted as something that was of importance to lots of people with accessibility needs. Um, it is the case that a lot of facilities, carers can attend classes free or at a reduced price or something like that, but that had to be reflected in the data for that to be known. Um, transport note, uh, because uh, people with accessibility needs are reliant much more on public transport than other groups, so that becomes a point of, of uh, utility for them. Um, and then a much more a sort of complex object um, for what was what was called uh, accessibility support, which is a complex object with lots of subfields within it, um, capturing first of all the description of what that accessibility support is, um, when that support was available. Um, so for instance, if there was a pool hoist or something like that, typically that kind of equipment requires a particularly trained operator to operate it, and that operator will only be around certain times. Um, so some sort of indication of when you could actually make use of that uh, needed to be given. Um, some kind of URL uh, to um, link to more information. Uh, a Boolean for whether or not you had to book these kinds of things in advance or give advance notice. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, and sorry, one final point, uh, and another controlled vocabulary, which is a sort of finer grained version of the earlier ones that uh, Nick developed and that London Sport are using. Um, and if you go to a link I'm about to post in the chat, uh, you can see that there's a, um, a controlled vocabulary there, which is quite different um, from the ones that, uh, the, the simpler ones that London Sport were, was previously using and Open Active is, is currently using. Um, again, based mostly on, on feedback from uh, accessibility and disability advocacy groups. Um, now the accessibility proposal as I developed it and as it's explained on that microsite is very much a council of perfection. Um, it's been, looked at by, I guess, six or seven different groups who have fed into it, and that feedback's been taken into account. Um, so it represents, I guess, the sort of platonic ideal of what accessibility would look like as far as um, people with accessibility needs and their advocates are concerned. Uh, on the other hand, there is no organization that currently implements this data or publishes this data. Um, I, think the, I think the control vocabulary has been used in a couple of London government uh, sorry, local government websites. Um, but the rest of it is entirely a sort of paper dream that I came up with and that other people agreed was a good dream and that's it. 
Um, so the question is, um, the question I was originally uh, confronted with by Ollie was what should people use for accessibility? How should they communicate accessibility needs? Um, and then I suppose the secondary question that that reflection makes me arrive at is, is it worth and can we get moving towards that more complicated um, model that I've outlined, but as yet doesn't really exist in anybody's system at all. Um, sorry, we've just been joined by uh, Andy. Hello, Andy. Welcome to the call. Hi there. Sorry I was late. Uh, no worries. If you could just introduce yourself for the sake of the recording, that would be great. Yeah, my name is Andy Gordon. I'm the senior product owner here at Gladstone, uh, representing everyone active. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Um, so yeah, so the uh, Andy, I was I was just uh, doing a long preamble where I was talking about the history of accessibility in Open Active, uh, and basically it boils down to there's a fairly simple controlled vocabulary, um, combined with another couple of data points in the spec that reflects the data as we currently have it uh, published within the Open Active ecosystem, and there's a much more ambitious. And from the point of view of disability advocacy groups, more desirable complex standard, which is a purely paper specification at the moment. Um, and so it's about, I suppose, the feasibility of going from A to B and the desirability of going from A to B, uh, as well as with what people on the call think that they can, they're actually capable of, of delivering. Um, so I, I can, I mean, one, one thing to kind of raise, I suppose, on that, um, from, from my perspective, at least, is just a, a question of how we, so the, 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 the great work that's been done to create the kind of ideal, obviously, is, 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 a, is brilliant, because there's a lot of, obviously, the input that's gone into that. Um, it's obviously also going to be quite expensive to implement for everybody, because there's quite a lot of stuff in there. Um, and so... And it's, although it's been uh, validated to an extent with people kind of reviewing it, it's obviously a very technical document, which makes it more difficult for people that are maybe less technical to get a handle on what that looks like in the user experience at the end and, uh, and whether it's workable. And so I suppose the question I have is, how can we um, test, I suppose, or, or you know, what, what's the kind of uh, the, the minimum well, you know, I don't want to use the word MVP because I don't think that's what this is necessarily about. But how do we how do we validate what's there without incurring a large cost across a, a, a number of organisations that are going to be implementing this um, before they, they then implement? Because I, I, I get the sense that there's, well, if we were able to say this is great and it works and everyone wants it, um, then it would be an easier sell to people than, um, you know, this is this is our hypothetical ideal but we haven't yet done that validation piece um and who would be positioned to do that validation i don't know you know with that for example is it something that parasport could experiment with to start with uh, and get feedback from their audience because they're you know deep into this and maybe they are willing to invest a little bit in that before other bigger systems like gladstone who's represented on the call kind of go near it because they're gonna it's gonna be much more expensive for gladstone to implement this potentially than than parasport mm -hmm. I suppose also one of the things that it, such an exercise could give rise to would be a prioritization as well, that obviously implementing all of that, everything on that microsite would be extremely expensive, but it could be that there's, you know, two or three data points are disproportionately valuable and the remaining nine are a kind of long tail of, you know, decreasing returns that are still valuable to some people, but not as important as more fundamental considerations. So yeah, it might be that we don't have to do a, a big bang um, I suppose the immediate guidance would be, well, hmm. I guess there's also a question of migration path. If we've got data that is in the form expressed in the current specifications, um, how difficult is it to migrate to the more uh, complicated vision? Um, I don't think it particularly is actually. So it could be that there's a path of sort of graceful improvement. 
yeah, there's there's probably some stuff to address just on a technical level about that because some of the properties have the same names, for example. So it might be worth us, you know, refining the the technical proposal to just make sure that there's a clear distinction between old and new or something, uh, so that it's uh, easy for that to be adopted. Um, that's I mean, that, that's far in the detail of when we get to the point of someone actually wanting to implement the thing. Mm. Um, I guess is, is it that prioritization piece that you say uh, before that in terms of just the requirements even at a high level? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll I'll, um, I'll perhaps unfairly focus on Matt right now because it was his question that gave rise to the the initial impetus for the call. Um, so Matt, maybe if you could outline some use cases that you've got, and that might help focus the discussion a little bit. Yeah, of course. So we, uh, well, we have something akin to the, the current implementation uh, as far as accessibility goes. So, you know, we, we've got aggregations such as physical disabilities, cognitive uh, impairments, vision impairments, hearing impairments. We also have a free for all field for anything else that doesn't fit in there. Um, now we use that for, for filtering, so we're a consumer of, of open app too. We use that for filtering data, um, but we actually gather a lot more intelligence on our users, so we do have a very granular understanding of particular issues that users may have. Um, so from our point of view, them aggregation still makes sense because it's quite simple for us as a consumer. Uh, but being able to go more granular and augment that, uh, and in our, in our sense, in a concrete example, we could then boost more relevant listings or potentially even apply filters. Um, so yeah, that, that'll work for me. The main thing is the aggregated idea that's what's currently in place, I think is still needed, but some idea to go a bit more granular uh, from a consumer point of view would definitely be uh, ideal. Okay, so there, there would be value it's uh yeah what, what's there is sufficient and and uh the future scenario would be valuable if it were implemented at some point exactly yeah um i was wondering if parasport had any reflections on the rather long uh introduction i gave uh, if barry and natalia want to come in thanks tim yeah i yeah i'm I'm relatively new to this, so it's like the, the, that context was really useful. Thank you. Um, and Dom will be the first to tell you that I'm not the the best at the the back end and the detail that was required to to get this to a place where we all would obviously like it to go. Um, what I would say is we could probably feed in on on some of those standards and terminology around accessibility and what because it, it language evolves obviously even since this was first looked at. This was obviously that great work that you've done, Tim. There. But I think there are some um, improvements I've noticed mm -hmm. um, just from quickly looking at it since you shared the link as well that could probably be applied. But we also have links of a really um, forward thinking and collaborative organisation that are, are looking to improve accessibility information across all venues, not just sport and leisure. So I think they'd be really valuable. And I think I've mentioned this to Don before about bringing them in to the, the conversation here potentially as well. Um, I agree Parasport could be a really good place to test some of this, mm -hmm. um, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't have endless um, resources to do that in, in terms of finances, so it'd be good to get a steer on what that might look like. And then what I would say as well is that it's probably, I, I don't know, I'm, as I said, I'm new coming to this, but and we're all bought into the idea of improving the accessibility information, obviously from being on a call like this. But I think it should be seen as a necessity for the for, for all organisations and not just to re relied on a disability focused one. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I would raise that point as well. It should like obviously there's the standards that for, for digital accessibility as well that, that, that would help with, with that. But I think it should be something everyone's looking to do, not just those organisations like ourselves that are targeting disabled individuals. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And I think on, I believe it actually is on paper a necessity that there is a requirement uh, that, it, that that facilities be accessible and that this accessibility be advertised and, and clear. Uh, and it's just one, Sporting Lynn did an audit of this some years ago pre-pandemic, and it was just that everybody fell down on it. I mean, there were a few disability focused facilities that did well, but except for really dedicated 
um, organizations, everybody everybody failed. Um, the yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. We're not we're not up to top gold standards on our, on our platform. Yeah, there's loads of improvements that we could make as well, but it shouldn't just fall on those organizations like ourselves that are targeting those people. There's, I think there's room for everyone to improve. Um, yeah, I think that's a secondary question as well. That the um, Implementing it technically, like Nick said, would be would be quite expensive. I mean, just just being able to capture the information, adding all of those fields into a complex system, storing them somewhere, making them you know, accurately updatable, all of that stuff is expensive and difficult. But then you actually have to capture the data as well. And it is almost certainly the case that a lot of staff at leisure centers don't really have an eye for this kind of data. Uh, you know, if they're if they're asked about accessibility, if they're asked to evaluate which particular kind of accessible uh, toilet facilities they have, they won't know. Um, so another part of the impetus for this work was that UK Active at the time was looking at funding a really big uh, data collection exercise across the across the entire country and across I think pretty much every class of facility to say, okay, let's actually get a good sense of what's available and what facilities exist where. Um, then the pandemic hit and that that has just sort of died a death. I'm not aware of, of any further activity there, um, but it would require, I think to bring other organizations on board, it would take a really, really large campaign, um, you know, or do it piecemeal over a really, really long time. But yeah, just having the standard is nice, uh, but it's, the more ambitious one is very prescriptive and it would take like a lot of funding and a lot of political will, I think, to, to get that data out. Yeah, a wide perception that it wasn't just the problem of organizations like Parasport, that it was sort of a, a universal obligation. Um, so I think, I think probably what needs to happen then um, in the longer term is some sort of migration path and some sort of technical tire kicking for how one could in principle get from, from where we are to, to where we would want to be. Um, so technical tire kicking about feasibility of doing that. Um, but also I guess there are probably issues about where we actually are now in that London Sport is using one taxonomy for describing uh, conditions. Open Active is using a similar but slightly different one. And then it sounds as though Health Place has got its own approach to this. Um, I'm not too sure how easy it would be to map across each of these. They seem very, very similar, but not identical, unfortunately. And then there's the question of uh, labeling, like, like Barry pointed out, you know, labeling can be quite crucial in these situations. Um, how do we, well, I, I can imagine different ways of aligning on that. And my, my preferred route would probably be to use the identifiers that are defined in the open active standards and map to those. And if um, there's not a precisely corresponding concept in the other taxonomies, we can extend that open active list a bit. Um, but, uh, Matt, I don't know how familiar you are with the ins and outs of, of the platform you're working with, but do you, do you know how that data is stored? Yeah, um, yeah. So we, so we have the ability to have uh, multiple taxonomies. So we have our own internal proprietary taxonomy, uh, and we also have the open active activity list, for example, uh, and various others. Uh, and we use quite a lot of inference and. Um, We've got a sort of ontology where these taxonomies map to these taxonomies. So we get the data we can, but we can infer quite a lot from that. We can understand, okay, if we're ingesting some open access data, uh, and in this scenario, it's got this accessibility taxonomy, we can set up a relationship to map to our internal taxonomy, which is what we use uh, when we're actually searching our data. So we're quite flexible, uh, and bear in mind, okay. It's not just open active that we deal with, it's various other types of support. Um, so yeah, we're quite flexible in terms of our mapping solution. Okay, so you'd be happy to deal with that more or less internally, I guess then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess that leaves, um, let's see, beta is wheelchair accessible. Um, I guess, is that something that you represent? Um, once again, at the moment we aggregate just by physical disability. 
Okay. Um, but yeah, there's definitely discussions down the line to get more granular. Okay. Um, and and Ollie, I guess um, would it be feasible to map to open active uh, terms, or I guess that's just an issue you haven't really considered as yet. Um, this might be one where Chris wants to jump in, but I think one of the reasons actually the kind of cause as well was because I just assumed to be honest it was mapping against the standards as they're looking into it that we're using slightly different terms. Mm -hmm. um, might be I don't know if Chris is aware of whether it's just this historic historic issue, um, but I think yeah, ideally we want to map to the standards as well map map to the standards, not as less because we'll actually map them exactly. So. Um, yeah, maybe it's something we can we can look at. Which I was just keen to know exactly which standards to map to. Right. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think the answer for now would be yeah the, the controlled vocabulary uh, defined by by Nick and and Lee I guess back in the day um, would be where to map to, and other considerations will have to be left for for later. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we can happy happy to pick up calls one on one and talk about that. But it looks like a pretty straightforward mapping. In fact, the um, Difficult one is, yeah, social or behavioral problems doesn't exist in the London sport mapping, or sorry, in the London sport taxonomy and um, open active doesn't have a contact us for more information kind of concept. Oh, but open active does have a uh, free text accessibility support field, which right. I think is used for that um, quite a bit. Right. Okay. So it's it accommodates that. Okay. So that's that seems fairly fairly straightforward then um, as a as a mapping exercise. Although if it's if it gets technical, yeah, obviously happy to have a call about that. Um, do, do do we need to have a well? It almost feels like there's the, there's a need to have a kind of plan or a strategy, I suppose, uh, in terms of open active more broadly to move this forward. Um, because I, I feel like this maybe is the third or fourth call we've had like this, where we kind of everyone jumps on a call and then we all we all say, oh, well, it's quite a difficult problem, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to need some uh, some broader industry support to do something about this, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Mm, OK, that's hard. And then we kind of put it back in the box again for six months, a year, and then we pull out again and go, ha. Huh. And then a different group of people, or some of the same people turn up and go, hmm, this is hard. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that that's kind of, I mean, the, the original spec was probably defined a few years ago now, it's four, five, maybe six even, I don't know. Um, so I just wonder whether um, there's there's also a need, I don't know how to do this even, because it uh, probably requires some investment, it probably requires um, some prototyping or some something um just to move this past that initial um kind of specification i don't think it's a technical problem um you know we've, we've all we've got the, the technical bits we need to, to do whatever the, the requirement is i think it's a kind of validation of solution problem um and and testing it somehow um and if we can do that so wherever we do that however we do that between us then um um or more more broadly then we have at least something to take to the to the sector to say actually this is quite useful this kind of information and be good to capture it more broadly um unless we just literally do say until uk active solve this we're not going to and and really push back and say it's not our problem because we need broader sector support otherwise there's no point and and maybe in that case we just take that official line so that everyone knows we're waiting on them uh kind of rather than you know uh it kind of going back into a void well, I think there's I think there's two phases there. So I think with I think where broader sector support is completely needed is with data collection that we can't just send out a bunch of web form links to gyms and say give us your data. Um, I think that data collection phase is going to be expensive and difficult and involve training. Um, I think yeah, the the validation of solution part I think is is not too difficult to undertake. I mean I, th I think. We're probably in the first instance talking about some wireframes and shopping those around, um, and then maybe we're talking about prototyping past that point. Um, that seems kind of doable. Is that what you were thinking, Nick? Yeah, I think I think it, maybe at a slightly higher level than that is where are the resources and the funding coming from for that exercise, and and how is that being prioritized? I think I think we had a similar conversation maybe a year or two ago where wireframes 
was one of the outcomes of the of the of the call. We'd have to check back at the, at the videos, but I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that we've had a similar kind of point before where that was the next action. But then, of course, there was a question of who was doing that, who was going to, you know, where was it going to get shopped around to? How do we get actual user engagement to check these things? Um, what's the best way of doing all of that? And so I, I, do, I do wonder whether it needs a specific almost, um, you know, little mini project funded somehow with some experts in it that do this kind of thing uh, that, that then feed the requirements back to this group and we can go great yeah that seems good um, you know something like that okay so you're talking about a, a funding kind of question really rather than a technical um, concern okay um, yeah I mean I think I think what happened with the last call I think it was if memory serves it was more than a year ago um, and yeah there were <laughs> probably there were other considerations. yeah <laughs> um, yeah um yeah there were lots of reasons why things got blocked in the last couple of years <laughs> um but i think it's a fairly i think it's a fairly modest enterprise at least in the first instance um and yeah i guess it's about finding the use case for it um is this uh back over to paris board i mean is what I, I feel like you'd be the obvious port of call for that initial kind of wireframing prototyping is this useful kind of pilot is that work you'd be willing to undertake or a project you'd be willing to collaborate on i guess is a better way of putting that absolutely yeah i think ultimately paris for wants to kind of go on to use the same form as open active because we see that as the future um but again like barry said i think it will depend a lot on the costs involved to us obviously we are a charity so our budgets are ultimately limited um but yeah absolutely i think even if we got to a point perhaps as a suggestion and this might be a bad suggestion or whatever um but if we got to a point where we had like the place and we knew what accessibility features a place had and then we had an open field for any other accessibility features i think that would be a good starting point um and i think we've got a lot of that data on Paris Sport in our open field already. Um, mm -hmm. So we could quite, I say easily, but technically easily, we could transfer that data, whether that was manually, or if we were to ask our clubs to re-enter it in a new form. Um, but yeah, Barry, feel free to, to add, but absolutely, it'd, it'd definitely be something that we'd love to collaborate on, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, it sounds like this is something that, as Nick was saying, definitely needs resourcing properly. So, you know, I don't know if I don't know the best way to to, to push that forward, but I'm happy to be involved in that, that conversation if that needs to go to the likes of Sport England or look outside of, of what they're doing to, to, to get the resources across. We're in conversations with them already. Um, so I'm happy to to continue that and, and, and understand the ask a bit more and what that would look like. To, to, to raise those conversations with them. Um, but yeah, as Natalia said, we want to get to a stage with our platform and then influence the further, you know, externally, what that, that accessibility isn't just an afterthought and it's a priority and is in, embedded in, in what everyone's finding to improve the opportunities, the quality of data disabled people can access to understand what their options are. Um, so yeah. We're happy to definitely have to be involved, take a leading role in some areas, but but um, more in collaboration probably because capacity wise, resource wise, we won't have all the answers, I'm afraid. Sure, not to, not to worry. Um, I guess the question that follows on from that is if we were to be looking for funding um, and additional resources, who else should we be talking to? So not necessarily who would provide the money, but who else would have really valuable insights that would help validate the work that say the ODI and Parasport were doing? That me? Uh, we, we, yeah, any, any, anyone really, but I was thinking mostly Parasport people, yeah. So yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't just be down to, to us to decide what, the standards are we want to get to we do that in collaboration with uh, charity partners the likes of sociability who have mentioned sense scope those those charities who agree what what the sort of solutions are um and then obviously there's the likes of ability net and the online 
digital accessibility sort of sector, if you like, to, that, that would need to be bought in as well, I believe. So, yeah, I think it would be quite a broad church, to be honest. Okay. No, I mean, that's that's useful. I didn't I didn't note all of those down. Uh, the fact that you know a good uh, dozen is is reassuring. Um, okay, well, I guess the action, the main action then is actually on me. I will beaver away to various ODI fundraising people and talk about where philanthropic funds might be found. Um, I guess the more immediate steer uh, from the call is to, uh, I think, more or less leave everything unchanged except for guidance about, yeah, uh, maybe maybe updating some information on the website to indicate that the accessibility specification to use is not the proposal. Uh, but the but the draft version, um, just that controlled vocabulary um, amenity feature. Hold on. The more I say, the more I talk about it, the more it's clear that some independent guidance on how to deal with accessibility in Open Active is needed. Not changing the specifications, but just making clear how various data points fit together. Um, so that's again an action on on the ODI. Um, the, the other thing I, I thought it might be worth just for completeness almost uh, just as as a kind of what some project like this could look like because tim you've already mentioned wireframes there i mean if you've got if we've got a situation where we've got a number of partners that already can supply this data or it's captured in in free text uh, as natalia said we've got some of that information then possibly it's a non-technical exercise to start with of just you know separating it out into fields in a spreadsheet whatever it is and going through it and saying right well actually what data do we have here where are the gaps and then getting that in front of people somehow to check that that is actually useful. So it's almost what 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 are we capturing? What what are the providers that the services that we're representing think is useful, or what questions they come and they get asked, whatever it is, mm. um, and then and then putting those into the the fields because we've it sounds like we've already done a lot of work around the fields that we've got to capture. If we combine that with free text and then. So, so, so it's almost going through double checking that all the things that we think we need to capture, that's how we should capture it. That's a useful, um, the things that we pull out of free text specifically need to be, as need to be a really good reason why they need to be filterable things, not just, you know, uh, separating them for the sake of it, because um, that's, it's expensive to separate stuff from free text, unless you're going to filter on that specifically, then, um, then it, it's, there's not much value um, uh, in doing that. So um, so it's almost just checking that all the things we're separating out are useful filters, that they're things that people will want to use somehow. Um, and, and that could be a closed project with, you know, for example, to start with Parasport as a data source um, and Parasport as a, as a front end and some beta fields being used in that environment. And so it kind of, you know, maybe it's wireframes to start with that gets circulated, then maybe it's going through the data that's there and that, that then can be uh, can double check that the stuff goes in, fits in the wireframes and that everything there is filterable. And then maybe if everyone's happy with that, then adding some, you know, some, some stuff into the Parasports application, for example, um, to feed that through so that um, that can then be searchable and then checking that that's all working and useful and people are actually searching using those filters for that audience. Um, and then if, if that works, then pushing for broader adoption from there saying, well, we've got the data from Parasport going into Parasport using Parasport because the audience is already there. Um, and then actually we want all these other booking systems to adopt that so that they can do that. So a project like that, but I don't expect that necessarily Parasport are gonna to wanna to fund all of you know the, the resources, do all of that work. And I suppose that's where suggesting kind of funding might be useful so that, that whoever is involved in a project like that, um, I was just giving you a sense of what I was thinking when saying um, you know funding rather than just funding for the sake of funding it. It's probably something end to end like that, uh, at least uh, from 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 my perspective. If that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a plausible development path. I think it's, I, yeah, I think it points all the more intensively back to that resourcing question, though, because all of that all of that work is difficult, obviously. But then I think it gets harder when it's an accessibility concern, because you know, like you said, you know, pulling data out of free text fields isn't that valuable. But I suspect. The perception of that value will change like it's for instance if you're using a screen reader um and i don't know how that works so the the kinds of questions you need to answer need to be scoped out fairly thoroughly in ways that i think most developers aren't familiar with so yeah i think the resourcing is going to be it's going to take more resourcing even to do that early pilot stuff i think than it would you know sort of uh typically on paper um, so, yeah, yeah. I 100% agree. It's not. Yeah, it's not. It's not trivial by any means, and all of that 
uh, we could we could cobble it together between us, but it it feels like it needs it that we don't have the capacity between us to do that necessarily without you know people prioritizing things differently or funding. So, um, and it may well be that an external agency or organization is well positioned to do a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bigger bigger issues raised, um, but a very a very clear development work plan outlined by Nick. So we will. Uh, We'll use that as our roadmap. I'll play that back later. Um, and uh, all we need is the money to, to drive down that road. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for joining the call, everyone. We've got five minutes. Uh, is there any other business anybody would like to raise or any other reflections people have? Uh, I do have a somewhat related question around, uh, so around these concepts um, and idea of potential changing or adding to them. Um, is there a protocol uh, for consumers like ourselves to, to be updated, ideally beforehand, so we can prepare for any, any changes to the concept? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, we run a kind of parallel process on the activity list. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a protocol for that. Um, beyond, by and large, we don't delete things from the list, um, so we don't break stuff. Um, that is another good action point, I suppose, about how we how we show those kinds of updates. Yeah, it, it would be good. So of course, deleting would probably be a big event, uh, as we were. That seems to be quite an uncommon thing to do. Um, but yeah, even updates uh, to existing tax. I'm not sure if they're mutable, by the way, but updates to existing taxonomies or additions, mm -hmm. um, it would be good to have, I don't know, something as simple as even a, a newsletter or something where mm -hmm consumers like ourselves are made aware of these changes so we can prepare. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, we do have channels that could be used for that, but we don't use them that way right now. So yeah, we'll revisit that because, you know, we've got the, the standards um, mailing list and that kind of stuff, but right now we're just not using it that way. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, that's really useful feedback. Uh, anyone, any more for, anyone for any more in the last uh, three minutes there? Tim, it's Andy from Gladstone. Just one from me. Um, I did message you earlier on via Slack. Um, not to do with this this group, but the working group that we've got tomorrow. Could you ping over the um, reoccurring meeting, please? Because it's gone from my diary. Sure thing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Meeting is so good that people are looking forward to the next one. Um, Okay, well, if there's no more uh, business from anyone, I'll, I'll wind this uh, call up. Uh, thank you, Matt, for that point about how we update. Uh, we'll revisit that and update you about that once we've got a, a policy. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. Good to meet you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.